Ready? Okay, so uh, we're at this point looking at a cross section of the trachea. Okay, and this still has all the labels on it from lab. Here's the esophagus over here, and again, we'll be talking about that this week in the laboratory. You can always tell the trachea because it has this nice open lumen. Now, this is kind of fake for the esophagus. Uh, they took a little bit too much artistic license here because this opening should be much more collapsed looking than it is because you're, unless there's food or some other object holding the esophagus open, it's not gonna have this nice space in it the way you see it here, okay? Uh, if you wanna refer to my friend, uh, Dr. Shotgun, on his shotgun histology, you'll see a much better picture of what the esophagus looks like in cross-section, okay? So let's start with the layers. As we're starting from the lumen, the layer of the trachea wall closest to the lumen is going to be the mucosa. Okay, and the mucosa in this picture looks like it has these little hairs on it, and those are the cilia of the epithelium that we find here, and we'll look at that epithelium in a minute. Okay, as we move past the mucosa, we get to the submucosa. In the submucosa, you'll see a lot of blood vessels, because this is a connective tissue layer, and you'll see these larger structures, which are represented in the purple, and those are mucus glands. Okay, and then the third layer is going to be the adventitia, and the hallmark of the adventitia is this beautiful C-shaped hyaline cartilage ring, okay? Now the other feature we should make note of is this material that you have here in the posterior wall of the trachea. Again, we mentioned that the cartilage was going to be C-shaped, so it won't go completely around the circumference of the trachea. The posterior wall of the trachea needs to be softer and more flexible because it's next to the esophagus. When you're swallowing a food bolus, which is what you call the material that's mixed with saliva that goes through your pharynx and then into your esophagus, that's gonna need to stretch this part of the tracheal wall. So you need something softer in here and stretchier. And so we have um, smooth muscle here, okay? So this is the trachealis muscle and this allows for expansion of the um, esophagus. Okay, now let's switch down to this image, which is a higher power photomicrograph. Again, we have mucosa, submucosa, and adventitia. And we can see with a little more detail what the tissue of the mucosa looks like. The layer that's closest to the lumen, which would be here, is a pseudostratified columnar epithelium with cilia and goblet cells, okay? So we can see that beautiful epithelium here. You can see the cilia facing the lumen. You can see the goblet cells here, and the goblet cells produce mucus. Okay, and we want this epithelium here for the mucus production to catch uh, solid material, little particles as they're coming in, and the cilia is then going to move that dirty mucus away from the lungs so that any material that gets caught there doesn't get down in the lungs to disrupt gas exchange. Okay, we'll have a layer of lamina propria, which is the connective tissue associated with mucous membranes here, and then we get to the submucosa where you have loose connective tissue and these beautiful mucus producing glands. Okay, so that's again another mucus producer for cleaning and humidifying the air. Okay, and then the adventitia has this beautiful hyaline cartilage in it, and the hyaline cartilage is firm enough to keep an open lumen, but it's soft enough to allow us to have movements in the neck, okay? Because you know your neck is a highly mobile part of your body, okay? So we need something firm enough 
to stay open with the pressure changes associated with breathing, but not so firm that we can't move, okay? All right, so we've talked a lot about the conducting zone organs. Let's get to the place where we have the respiratory zone, the places where we have gas exchange of external respiration. And here we have the two lungs. This is the right lung, you can tell because we have three lobes. This is the left lung because we only have two lobes. Okay, so each lung has an apex. That's the pointy tip of the lung that's going to be close to where your clavicle is. And each lung also has a base. It's kind of rounded surface. The other name for the base is the diaphragmatic surface. You can see it's rounded so it can sit right up against the diaphragm nicely. Okay, And the lungs, as I said, are divided into lobes. Uh, three lobes in the right, two lobes in the left. Both lungs have an oblique fissure. Okay, And both lungs have a superior lobe and both lungs have an inferior lobe. Okay, so because of that, you need to be careful about saying which lung you're on. So this would be the right superior lobe, this would be the left superior lobe, etc. Okay, now since we have an extra lobe over here, we're going to have an extra fissure. The extra fissure that we have is the horizontal fissure. Okay, and the extra lobe that we have is the middle lobe. Okay, and if we look at the medial surface of each lung now, we'll see one of the reasons that the left lung only has two lobes. You can see there's a lot more lung tissue here on the right than there is on the left. The left has to give up some lung tissue because of the heart. Remember, the heart deviates to the left. So this uh, depression here is where the heart would sit, and you can see a visible uh, sign of the kind of encroachment of the heart on the lung's territory by this uh, area that looks like it's cut out from the left superior lobe, and this is called the cardiac notch. Okay, and this big indentation back here is actually from the aorta. So it's pretty cool that we have that accommodation. Each lung is going to be or going to have an area here on its medial surface where you have structures that attach to it like pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, and the main bronchus. And this location where these structures attach is the hilum of the lung. And you can actually see the edge of the pleura here at the hilum. Okay, so the entire surface of the lung would be covered by visceral pleura. And then the pleura would double back on itself here at the hilum and make a second layer that would um, be attached to the surrounding structures like the chest wall and the diaphragm, the pericardium, etc. Okay, and so that constitutes the pleura, and the pleura, like all serous membranes, has fluid to lubricate the surfaces of these mobile organs and allow them to move in a relatively low friction environment. Okay, now once we get the air to the alveoli, this is where external respiration can occur. And there are three different cell types in the alveolus. We can see the three of them here. And most of the cells that you see here are this kind of tan color. These are type 1 cells. Okay, and the type 1 cells, you can see, are very thin, simple squamous epithelial cells. Okay. So they're specialized for the gas exchanges of diffusion. Then we have also these greenish colored cells. These are the type two cells. These are a little more cuboidal looking. Okay, and these cells make surfactant 
which is a material that decreases the alveolar surface tension and prevents the alveoli from collapsing when we exhale. Then finally, we have these beautiful blue cells, which are macrophages, alveolar macrophages, and they roam over the surface of the alveolus, keeping it clean so that there's nothing in between the air and the cell surface that would slow down diffusion. Okay, and here's Dr. Jan's beautiful representation. The blue is representing the stroma and the connective tissue that you have here. The brown are all the type 1 cells. The green ones here are the type 2 cells and then here in purple is a macrophage going around and cleaning up. I think he missed a couple spots here. Okay. All right, and let's look at our final panel here. This is an up close look of a type look at a type 1 cell and its relationship with a pulmonary capillary making what we call the respiratory membrane. Okay, so whenever you see those arrows, that means that oxygen's moving in one direction, in this case since it's external respiration into the blood, and carbon dioxide is moving in the opposite direction from the pulmonary blood and into the alveolar air. Okay, so the respiratory membrane always has three components. We'll start from the air. We have the simple squamous epithelium of the type 1 cell. We have the basement membranes of the two epithelial cells that are in the respiratory membrane. And then we have the simple squamous epithelium or endothelium of the pulmonary capillary wall. Okay, and even though we think of capillaries as being places where both diffusion and filtration occur, the hydrostatic pressure in these capillaries is extremely low to discourage filtration. And you don't want filtration because you don't want anything to make this kind of joining area between these two epithelia larger. If this area gets larger because of accumulation of fluid, then the diffusion rate goes down. And that's bad for us as far as getting oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide. Okay, so that takes care of everything for this week and we'll do the digestive system next time.